Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our new communication control and signal processing seminar. And I welcome you on behalf of the organizers, uh, Ajay Nageshwaran, Shagnik Bhattacharya, uh, Adwe Patra, uh, Zitan Chen, and my colleague, uh, Sasha Barg. And I'm Prakash Narayan. So like everything else, uh, this seminar series is going to be online uh, this semester and perhaps the next semester. And in fact, uh, we are going to uh, try out an experiment. We'll see how it works. Every talk will be on a whiteboard uh, in, and, the, and the style will be classroom style, classroom pace. And this will, we hope, enable us to assimilate the content, to digest it and to retain it for at least a month. So in fact, we, the, the, we are returning to our roots by doing so because this is how our seminar started 20 years ago. Uh, today's uh, question and answer sessions, uh, uh, Ajay will tell you how it's going to be conducted. But uh, turning to the talk itself, it's a great pleasure to welcome our inaugural speaker, Himanshu Tiagi. Himanshu is an alumnus of the University of Maryland. And in fact, when he was at Maryland, he was an organizer of this um, seminar series. And then he went to ITA at UC San Diego uh, to do a postdoctoral fellowship. And now he's on the faculty of the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. So just a few words on what Himanshu does. Uh, his areas of research of research include information theory and statistical learning, all interpreted in the most liberal sense. And when I think of Himanshu's approach to his research, I think of him as a young Turk. And the meaning of the word young Turk, meaning of young Turk uh, in the Oxford English Dictionary uh, adapted to Himanshu's case is a young person eager for progressive change in our field. And Himanshu sets a fine example himself doing this. Uh, in other words, he is a real live wire in everything he does. And with that, I hand you over to Himanshu. But before that, Ajay will tell you how we are going to conduct the question and answer session. Thank you, Himanshu, and welcome. Yeah, uh, since we want to keep it as interactive as possible, so during the talk if you have any questions feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question and at the end of the talk since we're expecting a lot of questions please use uh, the raise hand feature and i can come to you one by one and also you can type in the question in the chat box if, if it's possible so with that i'll uh, hand over to himaj Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much Professor Narayan for this uh, very kind introduction. Actually I just uh, I still feel as a student organizer for the seminar. It was not that long ago actually. Uh, and uh, also this is for me also the f a first experience giving a talk of this type. Uh, so I have planned for this talk in certain way. Let's see how it goes. A few warnings. If in the middle I get disconnected, uh, don't worry I'll come back. Uh, it, we sometimes have power cuts and then I may get disconnected. Hopefully, I'll be back. <laughs> uh, we have power backup, but sometimes we get disconnected. Okay. Second is that I will switch off my video. So, uh, it's not, so you just rest assured it's not a pre recorded talk. And the way to find it out is you have to ask questions. Uh, but even then, you may not be sure, but still. Uh, so, let me just uh, start the talk. And I'll switch off my video. Okay. So, uh, okay. So uh, this 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 talk is on inference under local information constraints. Uh, we will dis I'll describe what this means. Uh, hopefully you already can make some sense out of it. So inference as in statistical inference under local information constraints. This is uh, joint work with Jaydev Vacharya and Clem Okinon. Uh, since ITA 2018, that's where we, uh, uh, we, were, we, were, uh, we were all attending that conference and we started looking at these problems. And for the last two years, I have, at least I have been completely consumed by this topic. It's a beautiful topic. And I, uh, from the number of emails Jaydev sends us, I'm sure he, he looks more than consumed. Uh, and yeah, of course, Clemo, has, Clemo is also quite excited about it. And in particular, this the, the work I'll present in this talk are, uh, is further with uh, Yuhan Liu and Zitang Sun, who are uh, at Cornell. 
and I'm Himanshu Tiagi. I'm uh, at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Uh, at some point, I'll start writing as promised, uh, but I thought I can at least have some, uh, just for a quick start, I can start with some pre-written notes. Uh, okay, so, so as I said, this talk is about interactive inference under information constraints. So let me try to describe what is inference for us in this talk. So we will basically focus on discrete distributions, uh, but hopefully that will be exciting enough. Uh, so, so what is the setting? We are given independent samples, x1, x2, x3, xn, from an unknown distribution. So this distribution from which we are getting sample is not known, uh, p, on this alphabet x. So we will use this notation k for the size of alphabet x, for, for the size of this uh, uh, the, the, the alphabet. So we have already seen now two, two, two parameters of this problem, n, the number of samples, and k, the support size. And we'll look at two very simple inference problems for discrete distributions. The first one is an estimation problem. This is sometimes called a distribution learning problem or just a learning problem. For some reason, this particular uh, community, people who looked at these problems, call them learning and testing problems. Okay, so what is the estimation problem we look at? Given these samples x1 to xn, you, saw, you see these samples, and then you form an estimate p hat. P hat takes values in all uh, k in a, a P hat is a k distribution. And what we want is that the total variation distance, total variation distance between P hat and P, the probability that it exceeds epsilon is smaller than 1 by 100. Okay, so this 1 by 100 is some small probability that I have set. Uh, the reason I'm setting it to a constant is because the bounds that I'll present in this talk, the lower bounds, are not tight in the dependence on this probability of error. So you can put your favorite small number here, 1 by 1000, 1 by 100. Uh, 1 by 100 is enough for our proofs to work. Uh, but the third parameter that has come in now is this epsilon. So there was an n, the number of samples, k, uh, the, sub, the domain size, the size of the problem, and epsilon is the accuracy. So all the uh, results will be in terms of these parameters. So what you want is for every p, this thing holds. This is uh, this is the criterion we have chosen. You, you could have taken the expected value of this and asked for the expected loss. That's also fine. And of course, you want it to uh, hold for every p. So it's a min-max formulation. Uh, this is a very simple formulation, this particular one. Uh, I'm sure you can already guess the answer for this one. Uh, as you can see, this is a parametric estimation problem. This, this distribution p, the PMF p, can be described by k minus 1 uh, numbers between 0 and 1. Uh, uh, whose sum is less than or equal to 1. Okay. So this is first problem we'll look at. And the second problem we will look at is a hypothesis testing problem. This is called the identity testing problem, the one we are looking at. What is the problem? Uh, there's a fixed distribution Q. Uh, for most of this talk, we'll fix Q to be the uniform distribution on this alphabet X. So uniform distribution on 1 to K. So there's a fixed distribution Q and we want to test if the samples are generated from Q or not. Of course, you need to have some hypo some gap between these two hypotheses. This is a composite hypothesis testing problem. So P uh, is, is P equal to Q or is the generating distribution P at least a total variation distance epsilon away from Q? So some, somewhat more formally, uh, we need to form a test T which looks at the samples and output zero or one. Zero corresponds to uh, P equal to Q and uh, one corresponds to P epsilon away from Q. And what we want is that if P is equal to Q, so this probability is calculated under Q. By the way, I am pointing to some things here. If you can't see that, just uh, raise an alarm. I am assuming you can see where my uh, where I am writing and pointing. So under this distribution Q, the probability that the test output zero, as in the test output uh, accepts this Q, exceeds 99 by 100. So that's the probability of correctness. Under P, under any P, which is at a total variation distance epsilon from Q, the probability that the test rejects this hypothesis, P equal to Q, is 99 by 100. Uh, just to be sure, let me, uh, I'm assuming that most of you are aware about this definition of total variation distance, but let me write it here for sure. It's just a normalized L1 distance. At least that's one definition. So this is just P i minus Q i. Where P, Q, uh, P and Q are two uh, PMFs, probability mass functions, on an alphabet of size k. That's total variation distance. Half of summation i equal to 1 to k mod of P i minus Q i. So this is the uh, 
testing problem. Okay, these are the two problems which this talk will be about. Okay, so let me zoom out a bit. Okay, so so what is known about these problems? These problems we we want to understand the sample complexity of these problems instead of uh, asymptotic results. We are interested in the following question: What is the least n, the least number of samples n needed to find an estimate or a test? satisfying the conditions here so there are two different sample complexity we are interested in uh, for as for learning problem the estimation problem and the testing problem and we denote this sample complexity by n star k of epsilon of course it's a function of k and epsilon the size of the problem the dimension of the problem uh, and the accuracy epsilon so for estimation this is a like a folklore this is basically just the uh, parametric rate for estimation of distribution uh, you can convince yourself just by using empirical estimate that you can learn the distribution using k by epsilon square samples for testing on the other hand uh, a remarkable result of paninsky 08 is that you can you need very few samples to test if the distribution is q or not and uh, i'm attributing this to paninsky let's just think of the uniform distribution so you need very few samples to test if the distribution is uniform or not you just need square root k by epsilon square so if you have if you have a support size of uh, 1 million you need roughly uh, 1 million samples to learn the distribution by epsilon square but you only need about 100 samples to test if the distribution is uniform or not and and this notation here is rough so what, when i say this what i mean is there is an algorithm which gets you here up to some constant and no algorithm can beat this uh, up to some constant so so basically the bounds are off by just some constants so this is some well-known result. It's the background uh, that we need to move forward in the talk. So there's two problems we look at: learning and testing distrib uh, discrete distributions. These are the two problems. And what we know is sample complexity for both these problems. We know that uh, the sample complexity for learning a distribution, a KRE distribution, is k by epsilon square. By the way, k equal to two is the coin toss uh, estimating the bias of a coin problem, and there both look similar: one by epsilon square. So k by epsilon square. For KRE distribution and testing, testing if the distribution is uniform or not requires square root k by epsilon square samples. Okay, these are the two results. Okay, so uh, sorry. Okay, so now let's move to our setting, namely that of information constraints. Uh, this is a term that, uh, of course you may have seen this term somewhere else but in this context we have given it some meaning so maybe you can listen to this one a little bit more carefully so what is the information constrained version of the problem what do we mean by information constraint actually we are interested in this local information constraints but what do we mean by that this, this, we assume that this samples this n samples are not available at one place we assume that this n samples are distributed across n players and each player is only allowed to provide limited information about its sample. So this, this limited information is what we are calling a local information constraint. So each player gets a, one sample, player i gets sample xi. And in some way, we would like to curtail the amount of information this player i can reveal about its sample. So here are two examples to make things concrete. In fact, these are the main examples uh, that we will look at in this talk. Uh, first is communication constraints. Each player i can send only l bits about xi. That's the first constraint we look at. Player i can only send l bits of information about xi. It can choose. It can use any function. Uh, it can use any quantizer to l bits to send xi. Okay, but only l bits. That's communication constraints. Second constraint is what is called the local differential privacy constraints. So LDP constraint, uh, I'm just calling it privacy constraints. It's a popular definition of privacy. What it says is that a player I can use a randomized mapping FI, it can depend on I, to describe its symbol X, provided it satisfies the following con con condition. If you look at the distribution of the output given X, value of the sample of this player being X, and the distribution of the output given X prime, these are two different values. The output distribution doesn't differ by too much in the max divergence. Okay, 
Uh, more concretely, if you look at max of log likelihood ratios of probability of yi equal to y given xi equal to x and yi equal to y given xi equals to x prime, that max is less than or equal to rho. So we will call such a, this thing, this thing is called a mechanism, we will call such a mechanism rho locally differentially private. Okay, so this is another kind of constraint that we look at where each player wants to uh, help each player can only send information which will not uh, compromise its privacy. So these are the kind of constraints that people have looked at in literature uh, in, in prior work. So here is an abstraction uh, we want to work with which will capture both these constraints and many more. It's a very simple abstraction, uh, uh, a natural one for any information theorist. Uh, given a family of channels, W, this, this is my Kelly graphic W. So a uh, uh, distorted W whenever you see, it's my Kelly graphic W. I have a relation with Kelly graphics, which, uh, yeah. So if you get confused by my, non, by my Kelly graphic in capital, you have to ask me about it, okay? So this is my Kelly graphic W. So this is a family of channels, a set of channels with input alphabet X. It is given to you. And this represents our constraints. And player I can choose a channel from this family, WI from this family, and send YI. Y is the output of the channel WI when the input is XI. Okay, so player I will choose this channel WI and send it. Uh, I'll show a picture, but just to make things concrete, for these two examples, we can look at these two families. The first one is the family of all channels with output alphabet less than or equal to 2 to the power of cardinality less than or equal to 2 to the power L. This clearly captures the communication constraints. Similarly, the Rho LDP constraint is captured by this family, family of all channels, such that when you change the input from X to X prime, the log likelihood ratio for any value of the output doesn't change by more than Rho. That's the Rho LDP channel family. And in general, you can have any channel family. For instance, you can have this erasure channel family uh, and anything you want. Uh, of course, uh, it, 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 why would you consider other channel families? Uh, actually, this is something interesting in this Generality, this framework can capture, uh, this, this W can also represent uh, things like algorithmic dependence. What are you allowed to use in your algorithm to express your sa uh, sample X XI? But if you are, if you don't want to treat with, uh, if you don't want to deal with this generality, just think of this communication constraints and privacy constraints. Okay. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, Again, I can't see anyone, so I'm assuming everyone is with me. Okay, so here is the picture, which explains all of it. So these are these N people, P1 to Pn, N parties, players. And uh, player I gets this symbol, this sample Xi. So this Xi, remember, is taking values in 1 to K. So he gets player i gets to see some value between 1 to k. So this guy sees 2, 5, 7, some value they see. And then each of them can choose a channel from this family, w1, and use this xi as an input to the channel and they get yi out at the output. These are the messages. These messages are given to a center and a center can apply this estimator p hat or the test t to these messages. So instead of x1 to xn in the centralized version, uh, now we are allowing the now the tests and the estimators are applied to the messages y1 to y. Okay, that's the difference. And of course, the setting is exactly the same as before. Either we want to estimate the distribution or test the distribution. That's what we want to do. Okay. So actually, there is a lot of freedom still left. Uh, we have to distinguish between different classes of protocols here. There are different classes of protocols possible. So how do the players choose this channel WI? Uh, determine the class of protocols here. So we will basically talk about two broad classes of protocol. First is the simultaneous message passing protocols, SMP. These are the protocols where the uh, players don't see each other's messages and they just choose this channel WI based on some, uh, some randomness, independent randomness, independent from the samples and send the message. And the other one is this interactive protocols where the, proto where the players can see the previously received messages. Within this SMP, simultaneous message passing protocols, these are the non-interactive protocols. There are again two categories. 
private coin protocols where player can where player i can choose wi as a function of ui ui is the local randomness this player i has so uh, you can imagine that this u1 to un are so, so this u1 to un is the private coin are the private coins of the players with player i getting ui and these u1 to un are independent of each other because they are private randomness and the center also doesn't have them and of x1 to xn the sample the samples so this is the private coin setting each player has some private randomness uh, then there's a public coin setting where these players share this randomness u which is also available to the center and they can use this shared randomness to choose their channel wi so this gives them more power uh, in choosing this wi because they can always emulate this u1 to un um, from this u at least for the communication constraint setting okay so these are two different settings now in particular in this talk i'll also consider the sequentially interactive protocols so in sequentially interactive protocols the players have additional uh, additional information when they are choosing this channel wi they can look at all the past messages and uh, there is a much broader class of interactive protocols called uh, blackboard protocols where you just basically can go several times uh, here in the sequentially interactive protocols we just go over players once so first first player gets to transmit uh, the first player chooses w1 and sends uh, his or her message y1 then the next player can see y1 and the next player chooses w2 based on y1 and the public coin u and choose the choose the next channel w2 sends the message y2 now the third player sees y1 y2 and chooses its channel so on and so forth okay so these are sequentially interactive protocols so uh, going back to this figure so some more resources basically we are giving to these guys uh which is the least used color red maybe so so all of them get this u this is the public coin this guy also gets you and they also see the past messages so everyone sees the past messages okay and then they choose this one that's the setting here they, they use it they use the past message to choose their channel w and apply it to their uh, current symbol current uh, sample okay so so two inference problems general communication constraint general information constraints and these two uh, interact non interactive and interactive protocols Th these are the degrees of freedom that's what we are looking at in this talk okay so this brings us to the question why do we care about this okay you don't uh, there is no real reason to care about it but if you want to do some research then maybe you can care about it okay so here is uh, here are some applications uh, at least these are the driving applications for us so first application is this thing called federated learning everyone knows what it is and no one knows what it is basically it's everything you want to do uh, want it to be anything distributed can be called federated learning as far as i understand but uh, to be more concrete uh, federated learning refers to building models based on data distributed across clients and uh, you can uh, impose different kind of constraints on the clients privacy constraints communication constraints uh and you can also expand the scope to include distributed statistics as a part of federated learning but uh, maybe you can think of federated learning uh, separately from distributed statistics so these are topics which are i guess coming from the sort of application side but underlying these topics the specific problem that uh, we are interested in uh, and we have some uh, new results on but i will not be talking about it is stochastic optimization under privacy and communication constraints so think of uh, problems like uh, stochastic gradient descent and you don't get to see the gradient in every uh, iteration you only get to see limited information about the gradients okay uh, and till now i only described the discrete distribution problem but for stochastic gradient descent uh, actually a more interesting problem which offers lower bound for that problem is the high dimensional parameter parametric estimation problem that's something we have also looked at and then of course the more general not more general but uh, perhaps more perhaps harder non parametric problems so all these are of interest in this distributed setting and uh, really there is a, a practical need for now solving these problems so distributed statistics as uh, i mean this audience uh, knows history much better than i do but but it's a well studied problem in certain context but i my take on this is that while it's well studied i think the applications were not there so formulations were somewhat not matched 
to the current application. So no one actually knows how engineering application will pan out, or what particular features they'll capture. So it turns out that uh, while these problems are well studied and uh, there is a lot of uh, knowledge we can gain from uh, classic literature on this, exactly what we needed uh, now that distributed statistics is being implemented and federated learning is being implemented is kind of different from what was there classically. Okay, so, so that's what's happening here. Okay, so that's some small, I, I know Professor Nalayan promised that it will be hard board talk. I'll come to that. Uh, okay. Okay, so results for this talk. So here is a one line description. Basically, we wanted to derive some plug and play lower bounds for sample complexity of learning and testing under general information constraints. So it's plug and play in the sense that there are general bounds where you apply it for your favorite information constraints and you get something. And uh, we have some papers in this category. This particular talk additionally handles interactive communication. And this is based on this uh, paper whose preprint is on archive, interactive inference under information constraints. So here are our results uh, explained at a high level. Some of these are from prior work, some of these are from this work. So first result is for learning under communication and privacy constraints, which I already described, local uh, communication and local differential privacy constraints. It says that the sample complexity for learning for simultaneous messaging, uh, message passing protocols with private coin is roughly the same as SMP protocols with public coin. This is these results are there from prior work. And now what we can also uh, show is that that's also roughly the same as sequentially interactive protocols. They don't, they also don't help for learning under these two constraints. For testing, on the other hand, under communication and privacy constraints, we had shown earlier, there's something very interesting that uh, in fact, public coin protocols can do much better than private coin protocols. If you can use a uh, shared randomness, then you can coordinate to select your uh, W channel and that really helps you in sample complexity. I'll show the concrete results, but uh, this less than less than means order wise, uh, smaller sample, uh, order wise, larger sample complexity. This is a difficulty. Uh, yeah, so maybe I should keep it to sample complexity. That will be more concrete. I, I meant that these protocols are better, but let's, let's say this is the sample complexity result. So sample complexity for private coin protocols is much larger than sample complexity public coin. Uh, SMP protocols for testing. And now what we show, this is the, this is the new result, uh, is that actually, although public coin is better than private coin, but private coin is as good as sequentially interactive. Even if you allow some sequential, sequential interaction, you can't improve the sample complexity for testing. Okay. So these are the two results. Now looks like, uh, looks like there are, there is no case here where uh, interactivity helps. Uh, it turns out that this is only because of the, the constraints that we were looking at, communication and privacy constraints. We are able, we, we can find a channel family, a very explicitly, uh, we, we can explicitly construct a channel family. In fact, our lower bound suggests this channel family. I'll, uh, hopefully I'll be, get time to point out how our lower bound suggests. So we can find a channel family, a uh, family of constraints for which interaction strictly helps for testing. Strictly helps for testing. Okay. So that that is also there. So interaction does help for testing for a particular channel family, but it doesn't help for uh, communication and privacy constraints. Okay. So this is the uh, upshot. Okay. Some, okay, let me make the results a little bit more concrete. This table is lifted from the paper. Okay. So it, it has all the results summarized. Uh, I, I think I'll go over it just to get some flavor. out. So our results are in terms of this matrix HW, which is a K cross K matrix that we associate with this channel W. And it's IGF entry is given by this expression here. So look at, so this, this, this uh, X here in this construction is 2K instead of K. Since we don't worry about constants, we switch between K and 2K whenever we want. Uh, so this is X is the 2K. So what this does is looks at even um, the, the probability of Y given odd elements minus probability of Y given even elements. Uh, so this is Y given 2Y minus 1, right, the probability of Y given 2Y. Multiply the probability of Y given 2J minus 1 minus probability of Y given 2J. Summation over Y and normalized by the 
sum of all uh, the sum of the uh, probability w of y given x this is some matrix uh, we will see in the proof uh, hopefully we'll get some hint of how this form comes out but this is a matrix which we can associate with each channel w now our results the general results are in terms of norms of this matrix so there are three norms that our results will entail the operator norm of this matrix okay which is the largest eigen value yeah, it's a symmetric uh, matrix the operator norm of this matrix uh, and we are looking at max over all channels w the operator norm of this matrix so that's the that's that's this notation uh, that we are using here for max operator norm for the channel family similarly we are looking at the nuclear norm of this matrix which is the l1 norm of eigen values this is the star here and again max of nuclear norm is the star here and the frobenius norm of this matrix uh, which is the l2 norm of eigen values so so the order is this is the max eigen value l2 uh, l2 norm of eigen values and this is the l1 norm so this is smaller than this uh, is smaller than this that's the order okay so what are the results for general case hi the, Himan, may i ask a question this prakash yes, yes. Okay. this this matrix h of w i was trying to see what it meant it's hmm. resonant of uh, chi square distance does it have any connection to it very good yes exactly so that's how it will come out the the, the idea in the lower bound is to switch to uh, chi square distance uh, we'll see that and what that helps us with is that uh, it helps us to use some linear algebra to capture how the geometry looks locally and it is this matrix hw which will capture the local geometry and we'll get lower bounds from it i see thank you so it is, this is a very good point thanks yeah it, it is indeed uh, related to the chi square distance between the output distribution okay uh right so uh so there here are our general bounds so for learning it turns out that the so k by epsilon square is the regular learning bound and now you have a blow up of k by the max nuclear norm okay doesn't matter if you use private coin protocol public coin protocol or interactive protocol now for testing root k by epsilon square was the uh regular sample complexity now what happens is if you use private coin protocols then the blow up is the same as that for learning that's how the geometry changes uh if you use public coin protocols then actually the blow up is smaller remember this frobenius norm is uh this 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 frobenius norm yeah how do we compare these two blow up you can actually compare these two there is now a square root k here so so this is a k here you can compare these two this is actually smaller blow up than this guy okay. so blow up is smaller and it's captured in terms of frobenius norm and with interactive actually the expression looks very different the expression looks like the frobenius norm uh, the the nuclear norm uh, so the, this frobenius norm here is replaced by square root of uh, square root of the nuclear norm max nuclear norm and the max operator norm this is some result that we have now now in general actually this guy here is larger than this okay the square root in general but it turns out that for both communication and privacy constraints these two if things evaluate to the same thing okay so so here just for this concrete case of communication constraint the blow up is k to the uh, k by 2l so all these bounds are tight up to constants so we have we, i'll not talk about schemes but there are schemes which match this lower bound so so here for communication constraints the answer is k square by 2 to the power l epsilon square for uh privacy uh, for, for this is for learning for testing it is k to the power 3 by 2 by 2l but actually if you use public coin is just k by square root 2l and then this cannot be improved by interaction because these two norms these two quantities coincide for this case and similarly we have results for privacy uh this third result uh, is for that example that i alluded to so there is a constraint family which we call leaky query family it's sort of a binary query you can make a, a binary query you can check if the symbol is in this set or not that kind of query okay and it's some leaky query there is some um, there is some particular construction i don't want to spend time on this part but the interesting thing here is 
while again for learning all these three bounds are same for testing uh, in this case what happens is that private and public coin protocols have the same performance however with interaction you can really improve the performance so 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 this shows us that actually these two bounds are separated for some family okay this is the these are the results i'll present okay so some just some high level heuristic before i move forward so uh, the the way uh, these lower bounds come up in any statistical estimation problem is we try to capture the difficulty of solving some either emery hypothesis testing problem or composite hypothesis testing problem and we try to see how difficult is it to solve that problem in a neighborhood uh, in, let's say around let's say around the uniform distribution that's a good enough a neighborhood to look at now what happens when you have this information constraint is that you must pass all these samples from a channel family w and from some channels in from this family w and therefore by data processing inequality distances shrink and all these bounds are characterizing how exactly do those distances shrink in terms of these problems so that's why you are having a blow up in the sample complexity because distances are big uh, distances shrink and uh, as professor narayan have already sort of suggested that this shrinkage that we capture we capture it using chi square distance instead of uh, a kl divergence and that's why you see something like this okay okay so this is i think is this a summary of our results and uh, yeah so just a quick slide on prior work actually there is a lot of prior work on this uh, even if i don't review the prior work on classic statistics uh, the learning and testing are the problems in classic statistics so hundreds of more than 100 years of literature uh, but even setting very similar to our setting uh, there is lot of prior work uh, so there are few things which are new i think the testing problem that we have looked at the optimal bound for testing this is something that uh, our work provides this is the first time this work provides uh, also interaction is something that uh, we are now able to handle there was some prior work uh, on interaction and it was all it's very interesting actually uh, however it turns out that uh, it turns out that there were some small technical flaws in those papers uh, and there were several of them which also tells you how delicate this problem is okay this interactive problem uh, and these are uh, i mean these are serious papers with very good result but one of the results uh, because of this technical thing had this gap they, so so based in 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 a nutshell this interactive interactive uh, distribution learning under l1 distance was open and uh, interactive distribution estimation under l2 distance can be solved by uh, using a new approach on uh, using a fisher information based approach that was there okay. and uh, so sorry i'm being very fast with literature review here so just because i want to present a proof but you can go to the paper and uh, you can uh, get a thorough understanding of the literature there is a lot of work on this uh, but two things which are new that in what we are doing is we handle testing and we handle interactive uh, put present some uh, lower bound for testing also it it's a good time to ask some questions about the formulation if you have any okay so i i guess i'll just uh, move on then so for this lower bound for learning there is this probability simplex that we have and we want to learn this distribution p in it by looking at samples from it so what we do is we construct a difficult emery hypothesis testing problem this is a standard lower bound proof approach and we we somehow claim that solving the uh, learning a distribution will allow you to solve this emery hypothesis testing problem we show that and therefore we can lower bound the the loss in terms of the probability of error for this emery hypothesis testing problem that's the usual approach uh, for deriving lower bounds for learning uh, estimation 
And that's what we are calling learning here, learning a distribution, estimating a distribution. So in this setting, uh, I'll describe that construction, the difficult one. It, it is sort of standard. So uh, let, what we will give you is a family uh, of PMFs PZ, where each of this PZ is, is a PMF on 2K. Okay, that's this family. Uh, it's a 2K redistribution. And uh, yeah, in particular, this is this particular, uh, this distribution, PZ. equals to, I'll write it as a vector, 1 by 2k, 1 plus 4 epsilon. So it's parameterized by the z and, ah, okay, I didn't describe the z. This z is basically minus 1 plus 1 to the power k. So you choose k signs, k, uh, this vector is just k plus minus 1 signs. And for each choice of these signs, you will be able to define a distribution PZ around the around the uniform distribution on 2K. Okay, so uh, what what is this distribution here? This distribution is yeah. Describe what it is. Maybe it's better to just draw it. Uh, epsilon Z T. 1 minus epsilon z, 1 minus 4 epsilon zt, blah, blah, blah. This 4 is not so important. Okay, so what we do is uh, each element, uh, each element has probability either 1 plus 4 epsilon by 2k. Okay, even elements have 1 plus 4 epsilon, uh, either 1 plus 4 epsilon by 2k or 1 minus 4 epsilon by 2k. Whether it is more or less is determined by the zt. The, the sign for this. Okay, so this is the probability for the odd uh, part and this is the even part. So I, I looked at, I think of these elements as pairs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, blah, blah, blah. 2k minus 1, 2k. Okay, uh, first I choose a pair uniformly and then I flip a coin and this coin uh, for you, if, if this coin is unbiased, you will get uniform distribution. But my coin is not unbiased. My coin coin has bias one plus four epsilon z t by two. The coin for the tth pair, and that's how you get this distribution p z. So these are almost uniform, with each pair uh, moved a little bit away from uniform. So uh, we found this construction in Paninsky's uh, paper. Uh, it's we have been calling it Paninsky's construction, uh, but of course it's not too different from other constructions uh, used in uh, in max lower bounds for high dimensional statistics. Uh, but but this particular one where you first sample a pair uniformly and then you deviate the probability of even and odd elements of that pair uh, from an unbiased distribution. Uh, this is from Paninsky's paper. So is the is the construction of this distribution clear? Okay, so so here is the uniform distribution, and all these distributions P Z are somewhere around it. Okay, and what is something that you can verify is that the total variation distance between the uniform distribution and any of this P Z is exactly epsilon so they are exactly a total variation distance epsilon from this and that's easy to check you, for uniform you'll just have a, a one here and so you just subtract that and check this okay so we have constructed this family and now uh, and now what we want to look at is how difficult is it to estimate this z by looking at the output of the protocol y1 to yn. Since you can learn the distribution up to an accuracy epsilon, I'm just being rough here, you can somehow get to know this z. And we want to understand how difficult it is to estimate this z by looking at this uh, y1 to yn. 
So for that, what we do is the following. Let Z be a uniform on the set calligraphic Z, the signs of K vectors. And uh, so, and so you have the Z. So from Z, you get the samples X1 to Xn, and they are basically IID. Easy. And then from those samples, you get Y1 to Yn by applying your favorite uh, W1 to Wn chosen interactively. And uh, yeah, so that, that that's this, these guys come from W, uh, these guys come from that channel. And since you can estimate the distribution by looking at these messages Y1 to Yn, here, so these are the messages. Claim is that you can also get some, you can also get information about Z. Now, uh, there are various options we have to move forward from here. We can either use the so-called Fano's method or we can use uh, an Asua type bound. And in fact, uh, one thing we uh, realize, uh, by the way, As Asua's method is slightly tighter than Fano's method, at least for this context in just, just the expression itself. Uh, but also it is much easier to handle. So let me point out what uh, Asua's method will give us. So I'll write a lemma here. This one I will not prove. This is sort of uh, well known. Okay. So I'll call it Asua type bound. What we use is exact, not exactly the same. Uh, I mean, it is, we can use the same one also, but we need something less. So I'm just writing it this way. So suppose you have this local constraints captured by W and you have some epsilon that is between one and zero. And then you have this Y1 to Yn. So if you can find an N epsilon, yeah, some by 12 estimator. So what is this? This hopefully is self-explanatory. N epsilon by 12 estimator is and using N samples, you can get accuracy epsilon by 12 using W. So where information constraints are applied. Okay. Uh, then, so the output of this estimator will be uh, the estimate, but it will be based on messages Y1 to Yn, right? So then we can bound the information. Then uh, average information it will bound it. So what is this average information? Summation i equal to 1 to k, the mutual information between zi and yn. This is the public randomness. Doesn't matter, you can take it here or you can um, put it here. Put it here, sorry. Is greater than or equal to k by 2. Or maybe I should write it differently. The average information is greater than half. This is sort of a replacement for Fano's inequality. It's called a Sua's method. It it is uh, this this lower bound exploits a structure in a loss function. The fact that a loss function is additive across uh, coordinates is used in deriving this lower bound. So, but it's easy to remember. It says that the average information per coordinate. So, average information y n reveals about the coordinate ith coordinate of z. Ith coordinate of z, by the way. Uh, has an interpretation here. So you can think of this P Z as some kind of perturbation for this U, the center of this thing. And how much you perturb in the ith direction is the ith coordinate. So, so, so this, this Z i is a value plus one or minus one. And this, this captures how difficult is it to find out Z i from Y n. And uh, this lemma, it says that the average information Yn reveals about the Zi is constant if, if you have an, an epsilon by 12 estimate. Okay. So this 12 is nothing very magical. That's some, some constant we worked on. Okay, so this is a Sua's bound. So in, in a nutshell, what it's saying is that 
you can you need at least as many samples as required to make this average information constant and now any lower bound what it will try to show is that this average information cannot grow too fast as a function of n and when you combine these two you get a lower bound for sample complexity so all we need to derive is an upper bound for average information for for estimation problem okay is it clear so i'll i'll uh, that's the main result basically maybe i can call it a theorem so this is a theorem call it the average information bound so what it says same setting let me not try the detail of the setting what it says is that this average information for let's say t instead of n i'm using t t is some yeah well, i need some other parameter here it doesn't grow faster than t epsilon square by k times this max nuclear norm of w and there is some constant here 8 or something so this is the this is the main bound for learning actually it controls how fast the information about this specific problem grows once again uh, yeah this problem is sort of generic because it's capturing how much information yt gets about this ith coordinate okay i hope the statement is clear so this is the result i wanted to prove Okay. Okay. So grows linearly in the number of samples, and and this guy is more than half. So this right away implies, if you combine these two bounds here, let's call this something. Let's call this one. Let's call this two. So what we already get something from one and two. One and two imply. What do we get? We get that the number of samples that you need. to get an accuracy of epsilon by 12 sorry about this this will happen uh exceeds k by epsilon square this and i missed something here sorry yeah this should be k square this looks wrong yeah okay yeah k square this should be k square yeah so k square by epsilon square the max nuclear norm it right away gives that okay so that's the bound we had claim uh right so i'll just prove this theorem now let's zoom out a little bit okay so first thing we notice that this is conditioning on u but uh, it suffices to show for uh, u equal to constant because this guy is less than max over u uh, of this quantity so we we'll, without loss of generality assume u equals to a constant yeah because if you can bound it for every constant u then you can also bound for this one for the average u now i need to introduce some more notation so let p y t so p y t this is the distribution in y t plus i this is the distribution when we fix this ith coordinate to be plus 1 so the average distribution when the ith coordinate so you have all z except that z i is fixed to be plus 1 uh right p z y t ha huh, what is p z y t ha huh, p z y t is the distribution on y t when distribution on y t under p z 
and this one is the average when the ith coordinate is fixed to plus one and similarly you can define p y t minus i which is the average distribution which is the distribution on the output when the ith coordinate is fixed to minus one note that the original district we, we were taking z uniformly so this is exactly the same distribution given that the ith coordinate is plus one and this is the one given that the ith coordinate is minus one same thing yt okay uh if we denote the distribution of yt under uh, distribution of the output under uniform distribution by q what you can check is uh is that uh, so this guy is that's this this guy is the average distribution and you can check that this is basically the average of these two distributions p plus y t plus p minus i y t y t so you first choose this sign for the ith coordinate and then randomly and then observe it that's that's what the output distribution under uniform is And so we needed these notations. Now we'll uh, proceed by bounding our mutual information. So if you look at the mutual information between zi and yt, this uh, can be expressed as average of two divergences. The divergence is plus yt uniform distribution plus divergence between p minus i yt from this distribution divided by two. This is mutual information can be seen this way. Of course, uh, this these are just binary input. This is the in mutual information for a binary input. So you can further simplify. This is just using convexity of divergence as the average distance between P plus I and P minus I. P plus i, P minus i, y t, distance as in divergence here, plus divergence between P plus i Okay, so if you are already lost, I have to just stop here, take a pause and tell you that I am doing nothing basically. Currently, there is nothing drastic I have done. I have just looked at this mutual information, introduced some notation and just said that this mutual information which corresponds to figuring out if the ith coordinate was plus one and minus one or minus one is basically the average is bounded by just this divergence. And this bound is uh, more or less tight in the sense that I, I was not very loose in deriving this bound. It's the divergence between the plus, the distribution on the output given that the input is plus one uh, from the distribution on the output given that the input is minus one. Uh, sorry, the other one. And, and, and the, dis the divergence between distribution on the output given that the input is minus one and uh, distribution on the output given that the input is plus one. Okay, these two pairwise divergences come. Okay. Uh, now, what we notice is that in fact, this p minus i and these guys basically it just it, this is the average over all distribution except the ith coordinate fixed to plus one. This is the average over all distribution except the ith coordinate minus one. And this is my average called uh, this ith coordinate minus one, ith coordinate plus one. This guy can be expressed as by Jensen's inequality by taking this averaging over this distribution out. This step can be weak. I'm taking out this, let me just say, can be as in potentially, but in fact, the heuristic that led to this bound is that this is not really weak. So, so what I'll do is I'll take this averaging, the common averaging over Z out from this. So this guy here is less than, we'll get 2K. Summation Z is this random sign. Divergence between P, Z, Y, T, P, Z. Huh. So what is this P, Z plus size? Some notation. 
flip the ith coordinate of z. That's what this notation is. So, so what have we done here? This was some averaging over z with ith coordinate fixed to my plus one, averaging over z, ith coordinate fixed to minus one. If you take that averaging out, okay, then you can see an expression like this. Z and the ith coordinate fix of z flipped. That's the divergence you will see. This is what you get. So you just have taken that averaging out and you can do that because divergence is convex and, uh, and uh, by Jensen's inequality, you can do this. Now, why can we do this? The heuristic we are going with is that uh, other coordinates do not give much more information about the i. So to put it more, more carefully, uh, condition on the past, if we condition additionally on the other co coordinates, we uh, do not get much more information about zi until you have already determined zi. You will not get it before. So this step we are uh, assuming for these problems is not weak. We can do this. Okay. Anyway, uh, so guess not. Okay. Okay, now we have these two distributions and uh, one more thing then, let's look at the difference of these two distributions. That is something we can work out. So it turns out that the difference of these two distributions is the yt. Okay, sorry, before I do that, uh, yeah. so one more thing now. So I just focus on this part now and apply chain rule just for this part. Dark open. Okay. Bj equal to one to t. And uh, expected over pz y j minus one of, this is just the chain rule for divergence, j given by j minus one. Okay, okay so we can do this chain rule. Uh, and now we will look at just this guy. This guy is, uh, now, now we switch to, uh, at this point we will switch to chi-square distribution, okay? Uh, sorry, chi-square uh, distance. So this guy here can be further bounded by, this is just the single term for each time, how much divergence adds up for each time, you can bound by summation y in y. Probability under this z of y j equal to y given by j minus one. So I fixed this probability p z because that, that's what that's what taking that averaging out helped us with and probability y j equal to y this time under p z plus that ith coordinate flipped y j minus okay square by by this guy here so let me see okay need to ask some questions i i feel quite lonely uh in this talk So, okay, so, so this is something you can actually explicitly evaluate this expression. And that's where that, that quantity shows up, the, the H matrix. You can actually explicitly evaluate this distance. And it turns out this guy is, what you get here is 16 epsilon square by K times that W now, which W is your channel that you've chosen as a function of the past, Y given to Y minus one, that's because this is under Z and the other one is under Z plus I. So that difference, basically the, the, the common part will cancel and only 
thing remaining is the difference of these two things. This is all condition on yj minus one. So you get this. This is a calculation which has to be done carefully. I'm just uh, skipping over this part. But it will at least show you how that thing comes out, that h matrix. Okay, and then summation over x. X is basically 2k, w of uh, y given x. Okay. Okay, so what is this guy here? This is what uh, we had actually defined in term uh, for our matrix. This is basically the i i i entry of our matrix, i i th entry of the matrix. So that, that matrix is a diagonal entry of the matrix, the i th diagonal matrix. Uh, entry you have a question. Ah, okay. So yeah. So I think you can take it from the chat box, or I can say. So question to make him answer less lonely. The H matrix is related. To the construction where odd even are paired. Uh, R. So the H matrix is related yeah. to the construction where the odd even are paired. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yes. So this odd even pair uh, is tied to our construction, but you can think of it as a generic configuration, right? Uh, you can. Basically, or basically, you can order them anyway, and then define this odd, odd even, and then you can apply this construction for that ordering. So it is generic in that sense. But yeah, it, this particular construction is for a given ordering of elements of X. But the same construction can be applied after permuting, and so uh, this, I, I feel that this is uh, generic in that sense. This odd even just basically refers to a partition. Into two parts, and this construction is tied to that partition, partition of two equal parts. Okay. Uh, in this final thing here, we have uh, yeah, this is a bound actually. We have bounded the denominator carefully. This the bounding the denominator here is that that the distribution of the denominator also had this thing, but we can bound it and get this kind of thing. Okay. So that is it. So what happens now? So this is the so we have this uniform bound and this is for the, let's go back. This is for the ith mutual information. And this was, we had a conditioning on yt minus one. Ah, actually this, this is for w of, w of yj minus one. Okay, this is for w of yj minus one. But, uh, but then, what we can do is, so it's, when we combine this bound, we get summation i equal to one to k i of z. This is for this ith term, an expected value of yj minus one under some distribution. Uh, so I'll be rough here. So this is 16 epsilon square by k. And now we have summation over this guy. So take expectation and summation over this guy, i equal to one to k hw i i of y j minus one under some distribution under p z and you can take this inside first and then bound it by max so it turns out that for uh, that for symmetric matrices this this kind of matrices that h is uh, this trace is exactly equal to the nuclear norm. and we can take max over all w uh, sorry this w is determined by the past by the y t minus one or y j minus one and first we take summation. So that becomes the, so when we take summation inside, we get, what do we get here? We get the norm of this matrix. Okay. And then we take max over all W for this norm and that will get rid of this uh, dependence on YJ minus one. So this is less than or equal to 16 epsilon square by K. Uh, okay, that's, this is now the Kelly graphic W as opposed to a given W. I've taken max over all W to get this. And therefore the average mutual information is less than or equal to 16 epsilon square by K squared. Plus. Okay, that's what we had to prove. So let me just try to show the bound one more time. Yeah, so average mutual information is, oh, sorry, I missed. Yeah, so. This J, where is the summation over J? I missed that part. Uh, right. So summation over J equal to one to T. 
So you get your T also. Right. So very uh, the, the steps are first notice that we just are looking at this binary uh, input and therefore you can relate it to divergence. Then the seemingly weak step where we took out some average distribution uh, out, which is seemingly weak, but some for some heuristic reason, we believe this is not too weak for our setting. Uh, there is some discussion about this in the, in the paper. And then after that chain rule, and then we switch to chi-square distance. And the advantage of going to chi-square distance is that we see a nice uh, bilinear form of in terms of perturbation. Uh, so what, why am I calling it perturbation? The reason I'm calling it perturbation is that here is some slightly general view. If you look at this guy, okay, you can think of it as some delta z uh, plus one. So the, the change plus one. So you change from uniform in this way. So this, this is what my delta z is. And this guy here is a bilinear form in delta z. And uh, we exploited that in taking out this edge. Okay, this, the, the, that, that's the advantage of going to chi-square distance that you will see these bilinear forms and um, you can do some linear algebra gymnastics. In this case, we were able to exactly evaluate, but later for testing, you'll see some linear algebra gymnastics. Trying to do the same thing for divergence may be harder. That's that's one view. So it's the so it's roughly a formal way of doing Taylor series approximation. Okay, okay. So we get this bound. So average information is less than or equal to t epsilon square by k square, um, the max nuclear norm of W. Okay, this is for testing. It completes the proof for testing uh, for learning. Now I want to present the proof for testing if there is time. Uh, so that's why I wanted to ask. Himanshu, this Prakash, may I ask a question? Yeah, please, please. Okay. So if you had started your original program with, our, with, with uh, divergence in lieu of variational distance, what steps would have changed significantly? I was trying to go through the proof, but I can't scroll back. So in other words, if you didn't have total variation, but instead had divergence to measure your errors at the outset mm -hmm. what would have happened so i think for this construction this construction i'm, I'm just thinking out loud here works there as well okay the way this construction is the divergence is epsilon square by yeah, that's what i yeah but i'm not okay so if you think i i couldn't find anything here that was so heavily reliant on variational distance that you couldn't have carried it forward. So that's just a loss function. We are going with variational distance, but uh, you are right. So this, if you if you prefer, I'm not sure about the scheme. Uh, maybe that will also be fine. If you prefer, you can set up the problem in terms of KL divergence, the loss function. Uh, but uh, we set up in terms of uh, variational distance. I think let just me just go back. So, so this, what you're talking about is early on, right? You're saying that here right. itself. Yeah, right. Why right. do we have this is the loss function? Why can't we have yeah. KL divergence? Yeah. Uh, at least the lower bound, I think, will be fine. Uh, scheme. Yeah, maybe scheme will also be fine. I haven't thought about it. All right. Thanks. Yeah, but I, I think in this part, that's not, uh, th this analysis is not so much dependent on this total variation distance or KL divergence, but yeah, you can ask why not we use some other distance like square, uh, like the two norm, which is not a great thing, but mathematically we can take a look at that also. And uh, then the proof will change. The advantage of this construction is that this construction, each coordinate has a uh, constant distance and therefore all the norms are equivalent roughly. So this can be used to handle other norms as well. That's one advantage. Ah, good, thanks. Okay, so uh, sh should I, I can stop here or talk about testing bound, which is <laughs> the main part. Everything is the main part. No, you can go ahead. I think there's plenty of time and. Okay, 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 fine. So, so we saw the, as lower bound for estimation. Now I'll try to derive a lower bound for testing. Uh, testing at that. So we want to test if the distribution is uniform or not. 
me zoom in a little bit so that at least I can be clean while I can. Okay. So there is some issue with this software on. Let's see. Yeah, that much space is enough. Some jugar. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's now move to lower bound for. Testing. Okay, so we have already seen that uh, the, the difficulty for the learning problem was the Emery hypothesis testing problem. The difficulty for testing problem, we can actually use the same example. Okay, and uh, we can look at the problem of Distinguishing this mixture QYT. So QYT is, oh, maybe I should use a different color. This QYT, remember, was the mixture distribution. I think I called it, yeah, this is not a uniform. This is the mixture distribution. PVYT. Okay. Mixture of ID distributions. And then you have uyd which is the distribution of output under uniform and if you have a test that can distinguish pz uh, that can distinguish all the distribution that are distance epsilon from u using n samples then that test can also distinguish this mixture at least for average probability of error criterion Instead of Neyman Pearson, we can just look at average Bayesian probability of error criteria. And therefore, since it can distinguish this mixture, the only way that can happen is that the KL divergence must be constant. So KL divergence, this and this must be constant, some constant. With this constant comes from Pinsker's inequality and the connection between optimal probability of error and total variation distance. Just a quick review, just in case. So the Bayesian probability of error with equal prior average probability of error for P versus Q is half into one minus total variation distance PQ. Okay. And, and, and this guy, LN two by two DPQ, the Pinsker's inequality. And therefore, if this guy is small, let's say smaller than one by hundred for us, then this guy must be a constant, DPQ must be constant. That's all we are using here. Since you can distinguish U, y, uh, YN from any of these, therefore you can also distinguish U, YN from the average of this, the same probability of error, because probability of error, uh, you can just take this averaging inside. And therefore this guy must be a constant, this D, Y, T, uh, y N, a divergence between Y, Q, Y, N, the mixer distribution and uniform, uh, the output of that output distribution for uniform input. Okay, and uh, the main the main part of our testing lower bound is this lemma that I'm going to write here. So I'm calling it the per round divergence bound. Round here is this n uh, per uh, per round per per player sort of. So what happens in the tth round, t plus one th round? So you have already seen this yt. So we'll just use chain rule for this. Yeah, that's what we are doing here. Expected value of q over yt d. One day I learned to write on this thing. Q yt plus one given yt u under uniform, under mixture under uniform. This is a very complicated distribution. It's not an IID distribution. This is a mixture of IID distribution, this one. That is the challenge here. And so this can be done. And now we will derive a bound for this guy. What is the bound for this guy? This guy, we uh, let me just write it. DQ yt plus one given yt. Uh, u y t plus one given y t 
this guy here is less than or equal to 4 epsilon square some constants don't worry about this constant maybe i'll put the constant separately 4 epsilon uh, 4 ln 2 the operator norm max operator norm of the family by k epsilon square and what is interesting is that we again get that average information that's something interesting about the problem that we get that that we recover that average information okay so this is the main technical part for testing and what is uh, at least i find it quite interesting is that we can relate it again to this this average information for the same construction which we have already bounded okay so what was the bound for average information this guy here we had bounded it by epsilon square t by k square right that's what we had shown testing bound and so so when you sum over t what you get is that this d q y n u y n is less than or equal to sum of this guy over t so you get epsilon square by k uh, sorry you get you get this whatever that constant is 4 and then 8 from there i guess 32 by don't worry about this constant again i'm not even sure if they are correct uh you op epsilon 4 by k square and then sum over t from 1 to n and that's very interesting so most n square so you get n square so this grows like n square okay so it looks like this bound is very loose but what has happened is we have squared everything here also uh, so what we can actually control then is th so this information that you get per sample actually is linear in the iteration number okay but that's fine because we but but we still get the right bound that is the interesting part here so 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 this guy is less than this and therefore n must be greater than take the square root of this k by epsilon square ah i missed a, another norm which came from the previous form star norm square root of times some constant so i just put it approximately this constant one by this constant square root of this so that's that's what will happen if we show this bound open it up this part at least okay so no i thought i can print it up in single stroke fine Let me not save time okay so this was w operator norm by k i equal to one to k ah oh, there is epsilon square i think yeah okay right that's the bound so if you show this bound then you will get the desired sample complexity lower bound that we want to show so we have to just show this bound the per round divergence how much uh, distance does each player adds at tth round the tth player adds. and it is linear in t that that comes from our learning bound okay so that's the uh, goal now we want to show this so let's uh, derive a bound for this divergence zoom out is needed yeah so let me do that proof how do we prove this once again we'll switch to at the outset we'll switch to chi square distance so this expected value q of phi t of this divergence q of y t plus one y t and uniform y t plus one y t we bounded by the chi square distance it's fine This is my notation for chi square distance. 
15 yt plus 1 yt given u yt plus 1 yt and then you can then you can expand this okay this guy here and this can be written as 2k times y channel output y message y there's a nice form which comes out summation over x w the channel chosen by the past um, oh, there is an expectation here this expectation uh, y given x into q huh. so what i have done is basically i have taken out the input distribution part and taken out the output distribution this is just output distribution is just obtained by taking this linear combination of input right that's all i'm doing here so this is x minus 1 by 2k for uniform this is what happens for uniform distribution and then this whole thing square for chi square distance and again this time we had uniform uh, here so it's easier to handle the denominator okay. so if you do some more simplification something nice happens you get a very uh, nice expression so this guy you will see is actually 2 epsilon square by k into the same expected value over q y t this is a few steps huh. conditional expectation of z given y past transpose h of w y t and then conditional expectation of z given y t you get this this wyt is the channel chosen by the past messages so this is very nice form it's so what it, it is interpretable i i think we are not very loose to this point it's just replacing uh, kl divergence with chi square distance which is just lse approximation so that's fine what this says is that as you get more and more y you get some the the, the, the knowledge about z uh, is captured by this conditional mean so you get more knowledge about z and the extra uh, distance that you add is this bilinear form a transpose h a so which channel w will you choose and this is how we construct a counter example also the no, not the counter example we construct the example of a channel family where interaction help by manipulating this expression here so how will you choose this w at every time t the w you will choose is the one which is somehow best aligned to this easy given yt right so which has its say maximum eigenvalue val value eigenvector align with this that's the w you that's the w you can choose at every time interactive interactively so if you can track this you can somehow choose this but your family should be rich enough to allow you to choose that w the, the edge corresponding to your family should have all these directions present and that's how that counter example was constructed uh, but but this is why the chi square distance is quite powerful so now what do we do okay when you see a bilinear form A transpose M A A, well, the first bound to try is the following. What is it? So this guy, expected value here. And then what is the bound we should use? I guess all of you know this, what we will be using. Of course, the A transpose M A is less than equal to operator norm of A times norm A square, right? That's the bound we want to use here. Norm of this vector, conditional mean vector. This conditional mean is no longer plus minus one value. Square. And this bound can be weak in general, but it turns out this is tight for uh, uh, tight for both our communication family and uh, communication constraint family and privacy constraint family and 
yeah. In fact, we have an example where this bound is weak. Uh, this is different from the example where interaction helps. Okay. Okay, so, so this is good. Now you can take max of this norm and take it out. So you have two epsilon square by k max operator norm. So what was the notation we had? We had this. this guy and then you're left with this expected value expected value of this two norm by the way this two norm is actually a nice proxy for the information about z given by y it doesn't look like our divergence but at least it's square so it is similar to our divergence can you think of letting it to divergence though indeed we can just use pinsker's inequality the the main observation next observation this is from uh, i mean now, now that uh, we have understood it sounds okay it doesn't it doesn't look like something very fancy but actually in this form we found it in a paper by daiko nicolas uh, guliakis kane and rao and uh, yeah so that's it's just pinsker's inequality but it's interesting so how what do we do now so we can write this guy as summation over i equal to 1 to k expected value of z i given y t square. Now, since z i is plus minus one value, random variable, you can note that its expected value. So let me note this down here. This is a small mini result no need for a proof but the claim is for a random variable v taking value in minus one and plus one and uh, of course we know that the ex we can check quickly check that the expected value of v is uh, two into probability that v takes the value one minus half so two into uh, bias and therefore implies that if you look at ln 2 by 2 expected value of v square that is just the total variation distance square because this is just a total variation distance between uniform and this random variable and therefore you can apply uh, Pinsker's inequality to get d p v p u. U is the uniform distribution for any binary distribution like this one. And this is exactly equal to 1 minus h of v. Just Pinsker's inequality, but quite cute. So, yeah, maybe you've seen this form elsewhere. So it's for binary, any binary random variable, this holds. The expected value square is less than one minus HV. Okay, so we, we can therefore apply this bound here. This guy here is less than some constant times summation I equal to one to K, one minus HV. This is an important step which uh, helps us. Uh, oh, sorry, HV, what is V for us? H of, the distribution of zi, oh, sorry, not use this, h of zi given yt minus one. Okay. So uh, this is equal to some c times. Uh, so what is this guy? This is actually the mutual information between zi, ah, yt, sorry, yt. Mutual information between zi and yt, right? One minus this, and that's the bound. So that's basically we are done. So this guy here is equal to two epsilon square, less than equal to two epsilon square by k operator norm. And then you have this new term here. So that's one by k, uh, then you have, um, 
summation over i equal to 1 to k i of c i y t and yeah some constant comes in okay so just to clean it up it looks like epsilon square this is from the anyway, this part the first part here is just a data processing inequality applied in chi-square distance that's the one we used to get get this part out so this is a strong data processing inequality of a sort of sorts which takes out the dependence on the actual channel family w and uh, then it's one by k but these are all elementary calculations and it's very nice that uh, we still get something interesting out of it okay so the only possible weak step is uh, this one here and in fact we know it's strictly weak this step uh, there's an example but for both communication and privacy family this is fine good enough so this approach goes beyond this step you have to really understand the spectrum of this matrix hw as w moves over the family to be able to derive tight bounds and that's what we do for some other example uh, but in general this bound is good enough it says that per time divergence is less than or equal to this so yeah so so this is the per time divergence bound every time you add this much to the distance that's the result every time you add this much to the distance I think I should stop now. Um, uh, we have both uh, lower, lower bounds for learning and testing. Okay. Uh, I want to question. Uh, can you hear me? This Prakash. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, a very nice technique. So you look at the uh, uh, conditional divergence between two stochastic matrices, and then you're bound, bounding it above by the uh, chi-square distance, and then you use the quadratic uh, form. Uh, property to get matrix norms uh, in terms of the matrices that figure in the conditional divergence or maybe in a in a better sense over an entire family so is there a systematic study of things like this in the literature or this is uh, um, or this is completely new this is a very useful technique as far as i can see so because this this actually this bilinear form so we we have a very general version of this bound now so this bilinear form is very general to any information constraint setting that's how this this is a transformation that you apply to your observation and you get this edge here i see uh, yeah. so i guess the con yeah i'm also thinking what is the right literature to look for i couldn't find i think this is uh, okay at least for us this is very new <laughs> but uh, useful it, 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 it's it has wide applicability it's very nice yeah maybe some uh, other topics, maybe something in information geometry where uh, so such constraints are looked at. This constraint may be hidden in a different form. That is the thing. It can be hidden as an algorithm. For example, the same technique can be used to handle much more general classes of constraints. Right? They can also be used to handle like say, linear measurements. Yeah, Imre Chisar was uh, online, but he wrote to me separately that he got disconnected somehow. Uh, oh. But this is being taped, right? So maybe he can take a look at it and, and uh, see if he's seen something similar. This is very nice. Thank you. Okay. So maybe I'll. Where is the. At least the formulation mentioned. Yes, I should remember. Huh? This is a good picture to start. Okay. Uh, any other questions? May I have a question? So it's me, uh, Tomash. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so it was strange for me when you started your presentation and exposed the problem of uh, testing, for example, also the problem of estimation, that the probability probability was fixed and, and were the same. The type one and the type two error probabilities were the same. And fixed, then you mentioned that we can uh, sync any number that we like, but what happens when the error probability stands, for example, zero in a, with a certain rate? So when the probabilities are not fixed or they can differ. So for example, in classical hypothesis testing, the type one error probability is frequently fixed, but the type two error probability um, is not fixed but tends to zero as the sample size grows. 
So, um, it is possible to prove something when the best probabilities are not fixed, can differ or something. So, so uh, that's a very good question. So, I'll answer it in different, uh, there are many different answer, parts of this answer. First thing is that when I fix a probability, I'm fixing it, keeping in mind low, my lower bounds. And what I'm saying is if you have something like, I think it's 1 by 12, but I just put it as 1 by 100 to be conservative. But for 1 by 12, my lower bound works. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, but now, in now, some, now, yeah, that's, let, let, it let, doesn't, let, didn't appear in the bounds. That's why I... Uh, oh, it appears in the bound. That just appears, I, I just didn't uh, complete that calculation. You see that first part mm -hmm. itself, half into uh, 1 minus total variation distance. That, that will require some constant that appears in the bound. I was not very careful about okay, that. Okay. But, but let me come to, uh, I think that's a minor point. The more important point in what you're raising is, what about a dependence on this probability of false alarm and probability of misdetection mm -hmm. uh, or whatever. In this case, it's a uh, probability of uh, error of type one and type two. So that is open actually. The, because this is finite length bound, but that is open. Even for infinite uh, asymptotic bounds, uh, without information constraint. There's work by Sean Main, I think, which nails down that coefficient. And I, I think what is known there is that Hobden test is suboptimal and uh, collision based test must be used for this particular regime. This regime is of the case where number of samples grow like uh, square root K support size. That's the asymptotic people have looked at. In general, you can always show some dependence of log one by delta, multiplicative log one by delta loss. And uh, in this literature, people are happy with that. But there are, uh, there are papers which have tried to nail down the exact dependence on that probability of error. Even for the estimation problem, uh, that is interesting. But for testing problem, what is the exact dependence on probability of error? Mo uh, think, oh, this I have to be careful about. I, I don't think uh, it, they care so much about the type one error. Uh, it's the type two error that they have nailed down. And the expression is quite different actually. It's it's a much more complicated problem, but now on a like of of course this I don't know why I'm trying to say this thing is practical, but okay. So one motivation these guys use for this is that what is this extremely small probability of error that you're looking for? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, exponential decay uh, maybe is sort of a theoretical regime in the sense that uh, one by ten thousand. If you're happy with that, then this bound is fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's that's a lighter point, I guess. But, but to, uh, to answer your question, yes, that problem is open and it will be interesting to see what is the asymptotic optimal bound. Yeah, thank um, you very much and thanks also for the presentation. Thank you. If you have any questions, please feel, please feel free to Unmute yourselves. Oh, Jadev is. Uh... Jadev gave a reference. Uh, so, uh... That's the uh, Dayo Huang and uh, Sean Main's paper where they look at the the error exponents and show that uh, for example in the finite in the small sample regime how it's uh, instead of exponential you get a gaussian kind of uh, uh, error exponents which then become once you have uh, enough samples they become uh, once the large deviations kick in after uh, enough samples something else happens it's a very nice paper i really liked it so when i uh, dai huang and sean main <laughs> Oh boy, he's really an Acharya now. <laughs> uh, yes, this is uh, the Corona look. You know, this is very nice work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, so, thanks for inviting me. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, what, do, what, what would you like to do? Ajay is the boss. So, Ajay? Uh, is there there's no more questions than... 
Let to thank the speaker again. Let's thank. Thank you. Maybe you should tell people that uh, Himanshu allowed kindly the his talk to be taped, so it will be available, and uh, we'll post on our website where he can where where one can view the talk.